Great. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another NL seminar and actually our first NL seminar where you can also join us in person. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Yang. Kevin is a PhD student at UC Berkeley, advised by Dan Klein within Berkeley NLP and Bear. He is broadly interested in AI in the context of language and game playing, particularly in designing more modular and or language controllable agents. He's also interested in neural architectures for structured domain, such as chemistry. Previously, he worked uh, with Regina Barsley during his undergrad and Master of Engineering at MIT on natural language processing and chemistry application of deep learning, especially graph convolutional networks. It's uh, our pleasure to have you, Kevin. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And everyone, please join me in welcoming Kevin and enjoying his Yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, so today uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, two papers, uh, uh, both kind of on the topic of uh, how to use predictors to help control or guide uh, uh, generation, either like during the inference process or uh, during training. Um, so the first one is focused on the NLP or the text, text domain. Uh, this is work, uh, my work with uh, my current advisor, Dan Klein. And the other one is more focused on, uh, uh, mole on molecules in the chemistry domain uh, from my uh, master's uh, back at MIT. Um, so I'll start with this paper. Uh, this is uh, Fudge Controlled Text Generation with Future Discriminators. Um, this is by uh, me and uh, Dan Klein at Berkeley. Um, okay, so I'll start by doing a quick overview. Uh, so first, uh, what, what exactly is controlled text generation as we define it? Uh, then I'll describe our method, uh, fudge future discriminators for generation. Uh, and then in doing so, I'll show the experimental results and uh, a few of the example model outputs on uh, three diverse control generation tasks that we try in this paper. Okay, so uh, what is controlled text generation? Uh, so starting with this autoregressive language model that we use for text generation uh, without the controlled part for now, uh, this language model models distribution over next tokens, xi plus one, given the prefix x1 to xi. Uh, for example, you might tell it to generate text according to a prompt like this, uh, the issue focused on, and then it chugs along, generates text. And these days, language models are actually pretty good. Um, but in control generation, you have an additional attribute constraint. Uh, like you want uh, to say you want, you want something on the politics topic. And specifically, we have this attribute function a of x, uh, which says uh, whether or not the attribute a is true for your output x. Uh, in this case, whether or not uh, the output is on topic for politics. And this, this is not like a probability, like th this is just like a binary zero or one, um, since it's operating on the completed generation output, not on the partial sequence. So more precisely, we're going to say that the task of controlled text generation is to sample from the distribution p of x, uh, given that a equals true or a equals one. Uh, so the, the distribution of outputs x uh, conditioned on satisfying the constraint a. So by default, this language model isn't equipped to handle this constraint. Uh, so its output is not going to pass the constraint. Um, so we need a method for controlled text generation. Um, Actually, uh, I should have said this earlier, but feel free to jump in at any point if you have uh, questions, and I'll, I'll pause at like appropriate points uh, in the presentations as well. But um, hold on. Okay. I'm going to go my slides. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's look at uh, what happens if we use our method, uh, fudge. So if you have the same prompt with a politics topic, uh, here's what fudge says. And in this example, it kind of works pretty well. Uh, it's talking about institutions and constitutions, uh, and it seems kind of on topic. And I'll point out here that uh, control generation makes sense in addition to the usual condition on the input that you might see in translation or in summarization. So for example, if you're translating from Spanish to English, uh, then there's input condition on the Spanish, but we're also, uh, we could also impose this additional constraint that the output be formal, uh, which is where control text generation would come in. Um, so like during training, like you would usually, you, you see the Spanish input, so you know how to like work with that, but usually like wouldn't also be training it to do formal style. This is like an additional constraint we added in uh, at inference time. So say we have the Spanish input, uh, let me just move to the corners, we we'll see. And if you ask your off the shelf translation model, uh, it'll get the meaning right. 
but it kind of copies some ungrammatical parts of the original Spanish, like these repeated words in bold. Uh, so at the end, if you ask your formality classifier, it might be kind of mad at you. Uh, but if you use like a control text generation approach, like fudge, uh, our approach, you can get this translation, which preserves the meaning, uh, while also having the uh, also better matching this, this formal style. Uh, so one, one thing you might wonder is, uh, why don't we just do rejection sampling? You can just sample a bunch of times in the translator until you get one that passes. And this might work for some simpler constraints like the topics uh, or maybe formality even, uh, but it'll be totally intractable when you use constraints that are very rarely satisfied by your generator distribution. Uh, so what are some examples of these more difficult constraints? Well, one example is maybe uh, poetry. Uh, so for example, let's see what this language model says when we give it this input. Uh, this is an example from one of Shakespeare's sonnets. Uh, and even thence thou will be stolen, I fear. And thou art a good friend of mine, the king's guard. So I mean, th this is terrible. Like it doesn't roll off the tongue. It doesn't rhyme. It doesn't even end the sentence properly at the end. Like basically the only good quality is that it kind of looks like Shakespearean English. So this is obviously Shakespeare hates it. Uh, you can generate any number of poems using your language model like this. And Shakespeare is going to hate every last one. But if you ask Fudge, you get this. And even thence that will be still in my fear, or this shall be the end. That's pretty clear. So it's not Shakespeare, but it gets the meter or the rhythm right. Uh, it rhymes, and it ends the sentence in about the right place at the end. So overall, it's not, not too bad. So how does control generation work anyway? Uh, I'm going to give an incredibly oversimplified summary here of some ideas in this line of work. i just put fudge in context. Uh, so first, you can fine tune uh, using the politics example as our the politics topic as a running example. You can just train a bunch of text about politics. Uh, depending on how good your data is, uh, this might work great, or it could be pretty bad. Uh, it also might be kind of annoying to have to fine tune again next time if you want to write about science instead. Um, so another idea is to use a classifier. Since we're using a classifier to evaluate, we can use a classifier to help us generate too. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. So for example, you can modify uh, the model's activations by propagating gradients, and indeed uh, some previous works do this. Uh, or you could directly modify the model's output probabilities. Uh, so one advantage of this latter method is that you don't have to access the original language model's gradients, uh, which is nice if you're using something like GPT-3. Or you can even swap out the generator easily as better models become available, like maybe OpenAI releases GPT-4 tomorrow. And Fudge falls into this category uh, where we just modify the output logics. Okay, so finally, what is Fudge? Great question. Oh, yeah. You have access to the output logics of GPT-3? For GPT-3? Oh, I mean, in, in this paper, we actually use GPT-2 medium just because I, I was too lazy to use GPT-3. Uh, but with GPT-3, you can access the, uh, the output, like, I mean, I, I guess you can get the log probabilities. Um, it's just kind of the same thing. I mean, for the, but for the entire vocabulary? Oh, yeah, you, you can't get it for the entire vocabulary. You can get it for, like, the top 100 tokens or whatever. Um, but you, but you, can get, you can get the top 100 uh, choices. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, it'll, it'll, you can, you can ask for each step. Um, the API has like you, you, you can ask for uh, what what the log probabilities were for the top 100 uh, choices uh, at each uh, decoding step. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know why they limit you to 100 if you ask for it, but you can at least get that. So it's like kind of a good enough to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in, in any case, we use GPT-2 medium for our experiments in this paper. So. Uh, okay. Yeah, so what's Fudge? Uh, fudge, at its core, uh, it's learning a lightweight classifier for an attribute constraint. Uh, and then it's following a Bayesian factorization to combine it with the generator, uh, like the pre-trained language model. So the key difference from prior work is that we plan for the future, not the immediate present, as I'll uh, describe uh, more. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about specifically how uh, in what way uh, we plan for the future in a bit. Uh, and finally, fudge can easily and flexibly compose multiple constraints. So starting with this classifier and Bayesian factorization to get us uh, set up. Uh, since fudge builds off the base language model, um, so let me just build my visual notation. So you, so you feed whatever tokens you have so far into your model, uh, which models the distribution over next tokens. 
a new sample uh, from this distribution to pick your continuation. Uh, but we completely ignored the formal style constraint, uh, for example. So it's not going to be very happy. So what do you want to do instead? What you really want to do is to use your classifier to judge continuations and then mark which ones are acceptable given this formal style constraint in this case. Uh, so the classifier will look at each possible next continuation. Do you want? Do you prefer? Do you thus? And so on, maybe up to some limit. And then judge each one individually to decide which one is OK with. So then putting it together, we throw out whatever the classifier doesn't like. And then we select from whatever the classifier is OK with, uh, depending on the base generator's probabilities. And this gets you uh, do you prefer instead of do you want, which sounds kind of more formal. Uh, but this is kind of a subtle problem in this diagram, which is that the classifier is supposed to judge the finished sentence, not the prefixes. Uh, but here we kind of shoved it into our generation procedure where it's supposed to operate on prefixes. What we actually need is kind of this future looking crystal ball version of the classifier, which judges whether the whole sentence will eventually be formal uh, given the current prefix. Uh, and in practice, we implement the judge as a learned binary classifier, which runs on each possible continuation. And then for each one outputs the probability that in the end, the desired attribute A is going to be true, or in this case, whether the finished sentence will be formal, uh, given just the current prefix plus the next token. Uh, so in the red table, the 0.2 by want means it thinks that there's a 20% chance that the eventual sentence will be formal if we started with do you want, uh, whereas it assigns a much higher probability for do you prefer and do you thus, because those sound more formal. So then we sample proportionally from the probabilities in this purple table, uh, which are just the element-wise product of the blue and red table's probabilities. And this, this corresponds exactly to a Bayesian factorization for the distribution of our sentences generated by the language model that possess the desired attribute A. Uh, and, and this math is all in the paper if you want to check it. But uh, the Bayesian motivation is, is not really the new part. Uh, what's really new in FUDGE is that we explicitly distinguish this final classifier from this crystal ball future predicting version that we use during the generation procedure. And this distinction is crucial for the performance. Uh, OK, so here I'm going to move on to an example to see fudge in action. Uh, any, any questions on uh, this, this schematic diagram here? OK, cool. So uh, let's see fudge in action. Uh, here, call our finished English formal translation example. Uh, let's backtrack fudge to the step here. And again, we have this Spanish uh, KK in bold, which the base model translated verbatim as that, that. Uh, but by having our classifier judge the formality of possible continu continuations, fudge can modify its continuation so that it doesn't repeat the words here. And the end result preserves the meaning while also being a bit more formal. And this holds up in our experiments. So we have a classifier trained on a held out data set of formality. And it does indeed judge Fudge's outputs to be significantly more formal than those of the best prior method. While at the same time, Fudge is able to preserve the content uh, based on measuring the blue against the reference translations. So we're, we're not like just like destroying the, the original meaning to make things sound formal. Um, uh, so now, now let me elaborate a bit more about what exactly it means uh, uh, with planning for the future. And I'll, I'll try to show a bit more clearly why we really need this crystal ball classifier. Uh, so going back to our to politics topic constraint. Uh, so for simplicity, let's just pretend if, uh, just for the purpose of the talk that the politics topic is uh, just a binary constraint on the, using the single word constitution. Uh, so the constraint that we check at the end of, of, end of the generation is literally just a uh, grep for this word constitution. Uh, so this, this crystal ball classifier has a much harder task. Uh, for a given prefix, it needs to predict uh, whether each possible word makes constitution more likely to appear later. So how do we learn this? Uh, say you have this example in your training data containing the word constitution. Uh, the crystal ball classifier takes this and makes a bunch of prefix examples, a label with the attribute function a of x equals true, but because we saw those prefixes led to the word constitution later. And similarly, if you have this example without the word constitution, then it'll label those prefixes all as false. Okay, so examining what fudge generates, after a couple of steps, uh, we have the issue focused, uh, or, sorry, the issue focused on uh, whether the two, uh, and what if you hypothetically use the non-crystal ball classifier to guide the generation? Well, we get the issue focused on whether the two constitution. 
So maybe not. Um, we don't really want to sacrifice fluency completely, uh, but this classifier is a bit too short-sighted. It's all or nothing. Uh, you either have to use this, this word constitution immediately or bust, because it, it doesn't see farther than just like the immediate next word ahead. So instead, fudge is actually using this future looking classifier. Uh, so fudge is going to generate something which is still kind of likely under the original language model, but makes constitution more likely to be generated later on. And this classifier doesn't care whether constitution is generated now or later, as long as it shows up eventually. So here it's going to write about institutions, so it's on the right topic, which eventually leads it to write about the constitution. Uh, so indeed, in our experiments, uh, fudge is quite good according to human evaluations too. It really substantially beats the best prior method in pairwise evaluations at being on topic, while also beating it in fluency. Uh, so now I've demonstrated the importance of planning for the future through this topic control task. Um, any questions uh, at this point? Otherwise, I'll uh, yeah. All right. So, so your method is to just take. You have some classifier, which probably you'll know about, which is more than just a grep for constitution classifier, uh, and you um, just annotate a ton of data beforehand and train on all prefixes. Uh, yeah, so that that's that's essentially what uh, you would do in the simplified version of it. Um, it, okay. it the actual no, yeah. the actual method that we use in the paper for uh, oh. doing topic control is like slightly more complex and lets you do zero shot on uh, topics represented as bags of words. So it's a bit more flexible. Um, but the the basic training procedure is kind of like what you what I presented here. So I just like simplified it for for talk purposes. But is the topic um, the the classifier and the nature of a topic is limited in the work that you presented to being um, selection from bag of words, or is there something? Can you is this amenable to more sophisticated uh, approaches? Uh, so, in, in principle, what you what you need is like a data set of uh, labels for uh, like you, you you want to have a set, like a like a a sentence to a binary zero one label for whatever attribute that you care about. Um, so you can do this for formality where you just like have a data set that's labeled zero one for formality. Um, you can do this for a particular topic, whether it's a further that's on topic. Um, in, in this case, uh, in, in the paper, we, we do zero shot uh, for the uh, for bag of words topics by uh, doing some like unsupervised training uh, where you train on like for you, you just like uh, have you train a classifier that like given a word you ask whether this word is going to appear in the future um, and then you can, you can like it's kind of like the usual language model autoregressive training but instead of only looking one word in the future you look like you can look any number of words in the future and ask whether that word will appear uh, so that, that, that's what we train in this top control task um, if you have uh, so, so the topic constraint is a bit special, uh, so that we can do the zero shot with bag of words. Normally, you would, uh, if if, you did, if there's no special special director like this, uh, you would want to just have this this like data set uh, that you this like classification data set of uh, zero one labels probably. Um, but yeah, as, as long as you can like finagle your way into having this like classification zero one data set, you can use the approach. Um, and there, there's like. A lot, and for a lot of these, uh, for, for a lot of different constraints, it, it's possible to, like, you, you probably don't have to manually label them. You can like kind of manually extract the, the, the data set. Um, mm -hmm. So you can do it in topics. You can also do it in uh, in, in poetry, uh, at least at least in a lot, a lot of like different poetry aspects uh, that you care about. You can you can extract them automatically. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll go into poetry in just just, just a bit. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Um, sort of. So what you're saying is any anything that you can create a data set for, not even create a classifier for, but just a data set for. And there could yeah. be stuff that you can't create a classifier for that you can create a data set for. Yeah, I mean, you, you, can, you can, well, the idea is you would just train your classifier to match that data set. Um, but yes, but it might not be a very good classifier. For example, a classifier that um, is a statement of, uh, of facts that uh, did or did not come true, predictions that did or did yes. not come true, probably not going to be able to make a good classifier for that, right? 
Um, yeah, if the classifier sucks, then the method will also suck. Um, uh, so, you, so you do yeah, need to have yeah. a reliable classifier. Yeah. 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 Ideally, the classifier would be would be at least kind of okay. Like there, there are definitely some properties that this method would struggle with. Uh, like factuality is uh, is definitely a bit more challenging. Um, yeah. So some. Yeah. But um, yeah, well, that, that's definitely something that we would like to explore more in the future and see if uh, there's some way to do. Uh, this this I mean, these sorts of more, more challenging, uh, uh, more more challenging um, attributes. But yeah, I mean, what I gave you was a ridiculous uh, uh, example, but but formality is not a ridiculous example because um, it, I mean, limit. I, I'm just trying to get at whether the limiting you, you, you the examples you used for formality were contained set of words, and that is not exactly what I would. You, like if, if a classifier was really kind of predicated on contains a set of words versus like, you know, contains particular uh, grammatical sequences, that's kind of a different thing, right? And so if you're saying that it has to be something that can be classified by a bag of words prediction, that's a different story from just something that can be classified. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's not inherently tied to bag of words or anything. Okay. Um, we just, we just uh, formulate it as bag of words to be able to do this zero shot trick in topic control. Got it. Yeah, and then that, that topic control is the only task where we formulate it in that way. Yeah, um, it's it's just uh, the word the word constraint is kind of a convenient way to illustrate what's going on, and so that's why I used it here. Yeah. Cool. Uh, any other questions at this point? Yeah, I have, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so are you evaluating, for example, formality by the same way that you're incorporating formality into your model? Uh, the, I actually have, uh, th there's a data set that I, that I got, which has uh, formality labels on two separate domains. So there's like one, one domain, which is like formality labels on like entertainment topic sentences. And there's one that's talking about like family or relationships topic sentences. So I, I, so I used uh, one, one half of it to uh, train the classifier that I used to guide the uh, generator, like in in the method, and then the the other uh, domain is used to uh, train the held out uh, evaluator. Thanks. So, yeah, there's, there's like some effort to separate them. I'm not doing the exact same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, that's definitely an important thing to to do. I agree. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so I'll continue then. Um, okay. So uh, this is here. Here I'm talking about uh, compositional compositionality. Uh, this is, I'm going to start talking about the poetry task. Uh, so if you remember, we have our schematic diagram from before, where we had this judge of formality. And th this works pretty well when we have just one attribute that we care about. But what if you have another attribute? Like maybe you want it to be formal, but also be about math. Um, so now this old crystal ball classifier of just formality isn't actually good enough anymore. Uh, but you could you could also construct a classifier which predicts both attributes simultaneously. Uh, but you can do something that I think is a bit more scalable and elegant, which is just reuse the formality predictor, while you add a second crystal ball for the math topic. Now your generation is guided by one classifier for each constraint, then it picks something which it thinks sounds more mathy while also being kind of formal. Um, so let's see this in practice. Uh, so if you remember our poetry examples, where Shakespeare or, or the fudge example isn't actually quite Shakespeare, but it's at least kind of well formed. Uh, this task actually uses three separate constraints. So there's iambic meter, which means every other syllable should be a stressed syllable when we're reading it. Uh, we want the two lines to rhyme, and since the first line is ten syllables, that means the second line should be ten syllables too. Uh, and uh, the second line that we generate should also end the sentence afterward. Okay, um, so let's backtrack to halfway through Fudge's generation before it's generated the last couple of words. Pretty clear. Uh, so Fudge is using its crystal ball poetry classifier, which is a combination of the three classifiers, one for each of the three constraints. Uh, it would be perfectly grammatical to just directly say clear. Uh, this is only the eighth syllable, uh, so you'd have to rhyme it and a new sentence, in this, a new sentence in just two more syllables. So if we do that, then we're probably back to angry Shakespeare. Uh, so Fudge first generates pretty before finishing with clear in a period. 
And this shows how Fudge is able to propose multiple attributes using multiple classifiers uh, while simultaneously planning for the future as I described previously. Um, so actually, this, this is actually how it works in topic control as well. Uh, if you have a bag of words topics, you actually treat each word in the bag as a separate constraint and kind of compose them in this way. Um, but it's, it's a little more complicated than in poetry because you don't need every word to appear. So you kind of like weaken the conditioning by some, some, uh, some parameter. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the, the 10 syllable constraint, um, will, does it not tend to just kind of say, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good until you get to 10. And then like, if you're ending the sentence, you're good. And otherwise you're bad. Does it get more complex than that? Oh, I actually just like generate and then just cut off the generation past 10 syllables. Um, and if it, like, oh, you don't actually incorporate that as a, as an explicit constraint. Yeah. Like, I mean, oh, so I, I incorporate that as a constraint, uh, to tell it to rhyme after that number of syllables. And I have a constraint that says like, I want the sentence to end after that number of syllables. Um, which, which is like saying like, I wanted a, like a period question mark explanation basically. Um, but I mean, I could tell the model to just keep generating tokens for as long as it want. Um, so I, I, I just cut it off after the 11th syllable if it uh, didn't end properly and then call it a fail. Yeah, yeah, my point is, are you using a classifier the same way you're doing it to, to detect formality? Where like you're actually trying to classify it to say, will this sentence end after ten syllables? Will this sentence end after ten yeah, syllables? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, as long as it's one through nine, yeah, it'll end. Yeah, it'll end. Yeah, it could end. Nope, can't end anymore. Can't end anymore. Right? It seems like it would be zero. It would. It would not be a formative classifier. Sorry, this, the classifier is okay. So, yeah, you, you could. It, the classifier is different from saying like whether it can end properly. Um, the classifier is actually classifying for whether it will end properly uh, if you were to generate natural text. Um, so okay. yeah, so it's like e even though like it still could end like uh, maybe like it, it's classified, the, the classifier learns whether like GPT-2 generations would uh, have the correct property um, rather than like whether, whether it's possible to. Yeah, good question. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, oh, sorry. Was there another question? Uh, yeah. So, based on my understanding, the um, the different classifiers that you use in this um, this composed generation model, they're um, they're like transferable between models. So, like, if I wanted to generate, you know, formal math text and then formal text about politics, I could use the same formality classifier? Yep, in principle, yeah. Um, I mean, we, we didn't actually do this in the paper, but yeah, you definitely could. Cool. Um, OK. So what's left is just uh, the experimental results, uh, which, is, uh, which are, are good. Um, so the success rate here on simultaneously satisfying all three constraints is what's being shown. And uh, it's, it's more than double that of the best method baseline that we tried. Uh, okay, so that wraps things up for Fudge at least. Uh, the takeaways are uh, Fudge is a simple, flexible method for controlled text generation. And uh, just uh, reiterating our three main points from earlier, uh, we learn a classifier and a Bayesian factorization to guide the generation, plan for the future rather than the present, and it can easily and flexibly compose different constraints as needed while maintaining strong performance. And then our codes are publicly available. Oh yeah, Good question. Can you go back to your result? Yep. So you just you just evaluated the result on successful, right? Um, yeah, successful means like all three constraints are satisfied. But not good quality sentence. Uh, there's also uh, some measure of like of like grammaticality and fluency. Um, it's, I mean, it, it's slightly lower just because they're trained on like modern text rather than the Shakespearean text. So like, it, it thinks like Shakespearean text just looks bad. <laughs> well, I'm just surprised that the best prior is so low because I mean, there are prior methods that use FSAs to constrain it and they're gonna, as far as the those constraints will do great. It's just- Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, so uh, there's, there, there, there are some caveats. Uh, I, I didn't compare to the methods that are just like directly that, that so, okay. so. One, one thing with the poetry constraints is that uh, if you take advantage of the fact that these constraints are like, are, they're, they're, 
like the way the way I call in the papers they're like quote unquote like prefix checkable like give, given given the prefix as long as you don't like generate something that immediately breaks the constraint then then you can never fail the constraint um so I I I I, I like wrote it wrote like a footnote in the paper that like we exclude those methods because those methods like are like kind of trivially like 100 percent performance um and then well, the, the point is uh, not to like not to take advantage of that uh that that aspect of the uh of these attributes but there are methods that have that constraint and generate and then the, the the question then comes down to what is the quality of the actual output, right? So if you look at like Marjan Gazvinajad's um, thesis work, mm -hmm. you know she's got an FSA uh, intersecting on top of an older neural uh, generation model, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, you, uh, I guess you you'd still need to have a, a text quality method to understand. It seems proper to compare this work to that work because at the end of the day, you are generating poetry uh with a language model with some kind of constraints it's true you're using a different approach to do the constraint uh imposition but the the question is what do you sacrifice right i would imagine that because your constraint is somewhat soft that you actually could uh get better um better quality according to whatever you want to use as a way to evaluate quality even, for example but that would need to be tested yeah yeah i mean i i, I yeah i have a discussion of uh like the, the Gosman and Ajad work is exactly what I was uh, just discussing. Um, yeah, I, I, it's definitely true that like I could uh, like use the same kind of FSA uh, sort of thing uh, in, in this and in, in, like use the like apply instead of the soft constraints. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, I didn't directly like it's yeah, I, I wasn't it would be hard to like do a fair direct comparison along like those like fluency metrics as you say. Um, but yeah, there, there, there is uh, like there, there's like quite a discussion like in, in the main text about this. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's it for uh, this, this particular paper. I'm happy to take more questions. So, so this actually seems a lot, um, uh, another way to kind of look at this is that your, um, your classifying prediction model is kind of, uh, especially given that your interests are in game playing, um, it really kind of starts to seem like uh, a Q learning kind of approach. And I wonder if you've um, looked at that kind of angle for doing this. And like, okay, so I maybe jumped a few steps, but I, I wanted to just see if, like, did you, you know, you could, you could, you could see this as an estimating of, of uh, you know, future uh, ideal performance uh, that is, you know, kind of. It ends up, you know, if you if I start to say that, then that ends up uh, uh, yielding a totally different kind of training paradigm. And I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Yeah, that's plausible. Um, so, you, like one one way to to view uh, this method is as like you're you're kind of doing tree search and like looking like one step ahead. If you do doing like rollouts of like one step, um, and then like evaluating uh, the value function after one step. Um, you can definitely imagine like doing longer rollouts, um, but like this this way fits kind of the nice Bayesian factorization. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something to explore. Uh, actually, the the original motivation for uh, this work actually uh, I actually started trying to do this uh, in in games uh, rather than in text, and I eventually like switched to text. But originally, what I was trying to do was uh, I, I I was trying to write a write an agent to play chess that I could control using language. So I was trying to like, I was I, I had like a bunch of symbols that I could use to control the, the agent, like, uh, like saying like I want you to castle the next five moves, I want you to capture a pawn, uh, I want you to like throw a check in like next five moves or something, um, and like I, I trained this on like a bunch of games, uh, in basically the exact same paradigm, um, where I was I was I would train to say like, uh, oh, if I make this if I make this move, uh, do I think that the symbol that I want will will be true for the next uh, like five moves later, um, and I, I was actually thinking about putting it in the appendix here, but that would be too much of a distraction. So, yeah, well, I, I would invite you that there are games you could you could continue to work on games and not give up text by playing text based games. Uh, 
instead of instead of something like chess. And there, but there, the question is whether the class. That's why I was asking about the classifier because there, the like additional constraint you want is like win the game, which is not an easy thing to 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 build a classifier for. I mean, you could train on a bunch of like prior prior played games and and see whether or not the, the the things you were doing eventually led to a win, but it's not really the same kind of deal. Um, and so that that it seems that the reinforcement learning based approach could open up uh, a more um, a wider set of uh, different constraints. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely would need to explore more. Um, I'm sure it depends on the specifics of the the game as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's uh yeah there's, there's definitely a lot of uh, things to try um yeah i, I was actually I, the reason i did it i wanted to do it in chess was because i thought it'd be really cool if i could uh, control the chess agent with language eventually rather than using symbols like if i could tell it to uh if i want to say oh go 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 like build a king slot attack or go like develop space on the queen side and if i could actually say that in natural, natural language i thought that that'd be really cool but i i didn't i i didn't see like a clear way to Go from like the hard coded like symbols to like being able to control with language. Like, the... Yeah, that abstraction is pretty tricky and but really interesting. Yeah, but yeah, definitely an avenue for for more future work. I'm still very interested in that. Just one more question. Yeah, can I ask a question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, I can hear you. So. Okay. I, w I was wondering if you could apply this to uh, maybe enforcing safety into language models by try trying to train like a classifier that detects whether, you know, whatever you're trying to say is going to be offensive or not, or contain some kind of sensitive content. And then based on that classifier, just apply this. So the condition will be generate text that's not going to be radical, sensitive, or offensive, something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah like, for sure, actually. Yeah, this could be a nice avenue. And if you know any work that has been uh, pursued that direction. Yes, uh, several of the previous uh, control generation works that I cite in the related work actually do do that task. Um, I didn't do it in this particular paper because uh, I, I was kind of like trying to show like very different tasks uh, that involve like different ways of composing constraints and conditioning and things like that. But um, like there, there's there's no reason why you couldn't use this on like detoxifying text and yeah uh, there, uh, there's some of the like in the previous works are like if you know like there's like one called like plug and play language models which uh, is the one that like that propagates into model activations I think they they do this task do they maybe in their appendix or something but and there's also uh, another approach called Jedi which does this. Um, yeah, they, they, there's this quite a few papers that, that Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. Um, any other questions on this paper? Okay. Um, let's see. So I don't really have time to fully present the next paper, but. Uh, I can uh, present the kind of more salient points probably. Uh, let me switch to that one. See this uh, improving molecular design by stochastic iterative chart augmentation. Okay, great. Yes. Um, all right. So uh, this this is uh, work done uh, with my previous advisor at MIT back during my master's. Um, I mean, I, I, well, I guess it actually only finished during my first year of PhD, but I was working with that group. Um, 
So this this is framework with the MIT crowd. So the 15 second overview is that uh, we, this is basically a data augmentation approach. Um, you want we want to improve the state of the art in molecular optimization, and we actually do so by over 10% uh, in in two tasks. Uh, and it's actually broadly useful in other structure generation tasks as well, uh, as we'll show in program synthesis. Um, so let me just give the really brief rundown of the what the task is and what the method is. Uh, so let's say you're trying to make a new drug. Um, this, is the, the, this is the molecular optimization task. Uh, you want to say you want to treat COVID-19 uh, by stopping the virus from entering human cells. Um, so maybe you have some like promising candidate for your drug that has like a 78% chance of stopping the viruses from entering human cells. Uh, but you would like it to be 90%. Uh, so you want to make it better. Uh, and you don't want to have to redesign a mo molecule from scratch. You just want to, you just want to like modify or optimize your existing molecule a little bit. So that's basically the task of molecular optimization. Uh, and you can kind of frame this as a translation task. Uh, so you, if you can represent the molecule as a string, then you just want to translate this input molecule string to a similar output molecule string that has a higher score for this property that you care about, uh, which in this case would be the fraction of the virus that stops from entering human cells. Uh, and this output's not necessarily unique. Uh, you're happy with any modification of the molecule that improves the property score. And the data sets just like input output pairs. Uh, let me skip some of these slides. Um, so what we're doing is uh, essentially a data augmentation meta algorithm on top of an existing model. Uh, if, I'll start by showing the results, uh, it doesn't make, make things more interesting. Um, so there, there's two like properties that we care about uh, in this paper, which is QED and BRD2. Um, the, like the QED is some like synthetic measure. Uh, DRD2 is uh, like some measure, uh, measure of, like human of, of, like binding activity to some like particular human cell receptor, for, like dopamine or something. Um, and th this this metric is just like how often uh, if it's basically like top twenty accuracy, um, measured by some like crowd truth evaluator. Uh, so our augmentation is uh, this version in red. Uh, these, these two graphs are showing for two different architectures. Uh, and it's, it's, it's improving over the state of the art success rate uh, from, from like the previous baseline by, by quite a substantial amount. Um, and also it, you can use this in program synthesis as well, uh, where like we're using ours in red versus like uh, the non-data non augmented uh, and uh, this like reinforcement learning approach in green. Uh, okay, so let me let me summarize uh, what how the method does. Um, so the first step in data augmentation uh, is we want to repeatedly sample this bunch of candidate input output pairs uh, from the current generative model. Uh, so for example, you generate a bunch of candidates that are effective against COVID-19, but there's no guarantee for if those candidates are actually any good. Um, so some of those candidates might be great, uh, but those not so great. Uh, so the question is how we're going to filter down to the good molecules only. So the ones that actually do have 90% uh, uh, effectiveness against COVID-19 or whatever. So for each possible candidate drug, we need to check uh, that percentage. So this is the problem of property prediction. Um, we're given a molecule, you want to predict the property score. Uh, the key is that intuitively, it's kind of easier to do property prediction than to generate the molecule from scratch. Um, Actually, this this is this is uh, this, the same thing holds in programs. Uh, it's 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 very hard to write a program depending on your specifications, and this is the constrained generation problem. But it's actually really easy to check if the program is correct, and that's why this sort of approach also works in program synthesis. Um, and for the sake of the analogy in the molecules, you can think of the drug as kind of like a biochemical program, and it's, it's harder to design a new one than to check if the existing one is good. Okay. Uh, so returning to our method, uh, so we're, we're, what we're going to do is we just like filter down our sample outputs using a property predictor, uh, and then you want to uh, check uh, using property predictor which ones are like ninety percent effective. And then finally, you just uh, train your model on the augmented training set, uh, and then with your improved generator, you just repeat the process. Um, and of course, the, the property predictor that you use has to be different from the one you use at final ground truth evaluation, uh, same as what we were talking about for formality before. 
uh, in the in, in the fudge paper. Um, so we have a property predictor trained on uh, that, that's using like one architecture uh, trained on like one data set for uh, for for that we use during the uh, during the data allocation procedure, and then we use like a separate uh, property predictor trained on a different data set from prior work um, for the ground truth evaluation. Okay. So, so essentially, this is uh, just do data augmentation, filter with the property predictor, and then uh, train the generator and like repeat uh, the process. Okay, uh, let me skip over a bunch of these slides. Okay, so. Um, the, this procedure can all be viewed as stochastic EM. Um, this is nice. There's nice correspondence. Uh, you can check the uh, math paper. Um, and uh, another another uh, additional thing you can do is like since you have your property predictor anyway, you can just do additional filtering at test time as well. So not only do you use it to uh, do data augmentation during training time, uh, you can also uh, filter. Uh, the, so you're filtering the, the proposed uh, augmentation candidates, but you're also filtering the outputs at test time. So you just like generate like 10 times and then like filter before you submit uh, your final answers. Uh, this, is, this is actually also a quite similar to reinforcement learning in that you're using your, you can think of it using the property predictor as the, as the kind of the reward signal for your uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, yeah, uh, let's skip all these ablations. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe uh, the more interesting thing, uh, more relevant to NLP is this program synthesis task, um, where you evaluate the correctness for uh, head out test cases. Uh, so, so the correctness here is just defined as like running, as like passing the test cases. Um, this is using some like kind of toy program data set, uh, using kind of like toy language. Um, yeah, uh, okay. So, yeah, it's, let's see. Yeah, let me just skip to the summary because we don't have time here. Um, okay. So, yeah, it's a data augmentation meta algorithm for improving performance on structure generation tasks like molecule generation and program synthesis. Um, and it, it improves the, uh, over the, the best prior method that we uh, found uh, by, by quite a lot in both uh, molecule optimization and also in. Uh, for the for the same architecture in uh, program synthesis, uh, and not also proves over a uh, strong RL approach as well. So, yeah, uh, that that's the that's the brief version of this paper. Um, happy to take some questions if uh, you say still have time. I uh, I have a question. Yeah. So, I'm curious, what are kind of the the constraints on this probability or this, excuse me, this property predictor, like how good does that predictor have to be before the data augmentation approach is useful? Um, yeah, we have an ablation on this that I skipped. Uh, we, we found that it actually works pretty well, even if the predictor gets much worse. Um, so so the, the property is on a scale from zero to one. Um, so here I'm plotting uh, what the, on the y-axis is the eventual is, is the is the eventual success rate the main metric uh, that that we get at the end after this whole data augmentation is done. Uh, the x-axis is plotting uh, the, the quality of the of the property predictor that we use during the data augmentation process for filtering. Um, you can see that the RMSC is actually getting quite big, uh, but uh, it's still better than the, the blue line, which is uh, what what the performance is before augmentation. Um, so at least in this case, it is actually quite robust to the quality of the predictor. Yeah. Um, does the predictor change over the course of this? No, the predictor is actually fixed. Um, it, it is, uh, in principle, you could change it as well. Um, but the, the predictor tends to be, I mean, it's, 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 it's just the analogy where like it's easier to, to run the program than to write it. The predictor just tends to be a lot better. So we, we just train it before the whole process starts and then just fix the, that, the predictor. So wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense to have that be part of the actual generator then? Like just never, never generate anything that your predictor doesn't already allow to begin with? And you already have a perfect model? Uh, 
you can view it like that. Um, you, the, it, the generator uh, at the beginning, uh, it's, it, it's probability of generating something good is uh, quite low. Um, so there's like for a lot of the targets that you care about, you actually, you can sample like hundreds of molecules and you actually won't get anything good. Um, so it's kind of like working its way through the training set uh, over the course of uh, iterations almost. Um, so when you, when you when you do the state augmentation, like in the first iteration, you often only you often don't get uh, targets for everything in the uh, for everything in your training set or in your uh, in your so in, or in your uh, unlabeled set. So there's there's also uh, a component of uh, semi supervised learning here where you have your uh, initial training data set of uh, input output pairs, but you can also just throw in a bunch of extra inputs that you want to optimize. And in principle, you can find uh, new targets for them, um, but uh, you might not find uh, new targets uh, initially. But as as you do more rounds of the the augmentation, uh, you're, you become more likely to find uh, more targets for those uh, in a reasonable time frame. And in this way, sorry, in this way, doesn't it sort of like nicely connect to Fudge work? Because now in Fudge, you have a generator that off its base, it's able to produce some desirable output then for which you can bring in the predictor, which now is able to sort of filters, filters out that output. At the same time, you have this nice capability that you can do the predictor at the same time of generation, but at the same time, you need to do more complex things to train the classifier. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, it just nicely connects to Fudge. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the connection is kind of uh, using the predictor to guide the generator. Um, the, the details are, are obviously different, but yeah, that's kind of the high level <laughs> connection. Pres Presumably, um, these will be different chapters of your PhD thesis. Though, right? like, very, yeah, 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 <laughs> ideally. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot along with that. A question? Uh, so, on the just to confirm you on your y, uh, x axis, the predictor can be 100% correct? Uh, you said that, oh, like the that, sorry, no, that, that the the far left dot is the oracle. Um, that's like if the predictor is one hundred percent, then that's what it would be. Oh, okay, um, the, okay. the second dot is uh, what we actually use. Um, the predictor that we use is not perfect. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, that that that, that oracle dot is just there as a to, to for the purposes of this, this ablation. Yeah. Got it. What's the nature of this model of the actual model in, in this case, your generation model? The generation model. Uh, the generation model is actually just as. Uh, sequence to sequence model uh, but there's a couple of different architectures we try but most of the ablations are the sequence to sequence model um, so there's a sequence to sequence model on the left and there's a, a there's a there's a graph neural network on the right so the the graph network works by there, there's okay, uh, I, I don't have time to get into the details of this but uh, if you're familiar with graph neural network graph convolutions it's doing some graph convolutions um, on a on like a substructure graph. So they, they, this, this method first converts the molecule graph, which is like a graph over atoms and bonds to a quote unquote like motif graph, which is like kind of like taking like atom bond substructures and like, it's kind of like how you can turn characters into subwords uh, in NLP um, and then working on that graph. Uh, and then they have a procedure for decoding uh, into the those into the the original into a new uh, atom bond graph from the from the latent embedding as well. Um, so that 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 kind of approach tends to work uh, better than uh, strings, um, but I mean strings are easier to use if you're doing NLP. Yeah, and the, the, one, the one on the left question. is just strings. Oh yeah. If nobody else has one, um, so are the the properties in in this approach are they also composable like in fudge so let's say i wanted a molecule that like gets into the cells better but also has some property that makes it like cheap enough to make in large quantities yeah yeah nothing stops you from doing this like you can just say that your filter is uh you, you can you can you can make a filter that says that only returns one if both of them are true uh, but another way in which some people do this kind of multi-property optimization is you have like one predictor for each property. 
And then uh, you kind of add like another code to your input. So like in addition to uh, your input molecule, you'll tell the model, uh, like if you have like three properties, you'll have like a length three input of like zeros and ones that says like which properties you want to optimize for. And then if you have like a bunch of data sets for like each property individually, uh, you, can, you can kind of like train each of those individually uh, by saying, by like turning those into inputs where you said like, oh, I only wanted to optimize for that property specifically. Um, and then uh, later on, if you, uh, if you want to do multi-property optimization, you just like feed in the input, but like you just feed those control codes saying like, oh, I want to optimize for all three uh, simultaneously or something. So that, that, that's at least one approach that people have done to do this multi-property stuff. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's actually like one other like nuance to the architecture, which is that like because it's kind of a one-to-many translation, uh, like where there's like a lot of different possible modifications that would work for a given input. Um, there's this like quote unquote stochastic latent codes idea where like in addition to the input, you also give it like a low dimensional embedding of the of the target during training so that it learns to use this like embedding. Uh, during the during the uh, translation, and then at test time, you can feed in like random embeddings so that uh, to to improve the diversity of the generation by by quite a substantial amount. So that, that's uh, what this that's why it's called it has like a V seek to seek. And it's like referring to that architecture there. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience here, or maybe the audience online? Okay, in that case, I think we can once again thank Kevin for joining us and for the great talk and all the great discussions. Thank you for your time, and we will see you next time. Thanks for having me. This was, uh, this was fun, fun uh, talking to you guys. Yes, yeah, great question.